So welcome everyone to the first webinar of the 2022 year. I'm Sarah Hanawald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at Wood Schoolhouse. And I have a colleague and frequent guest of mine, Liz Cates, who is joining me here today. So Liz, do you want to just do a brief reminder to everybody? Many of our audience will know exactly who you are. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and some basic slides. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Cates. I'm the assistant head for school partnerships here at One Schoolhouse, um, which means that I have the lucky job of working with the more than 250 schools in our consortium um, to help them solve their problems uh, that are happening right now and to help them think strategically about how to be future ready. Great. Thank you so much, Liz. And Liz, you wrote our post this week on our blog, and we have gotten some tremendous feedback already. So if you have not read that yet, please uh, click the link um, right after this webinar or right below if you're watching on YouTube and check that out. Next week's webinar, Peter Gao is joining me. He's got a new book out about mentoring, and we're going to talk about mentoring in the larger scale for leadership development, but we're also going to talk about what it means to have a mentor and be a mentor when you're solving problems that neither of you have seen before. So we have some exciting things going on. Liz, you want to tell everybody the call for teachers? Sure. So um, the first thing is that One Schoolhouse is looking for some great educators. Um, we have our annual call for teachers open, looking for folks who are interested in teaching with us in both our summer program and our uh, academic year program. Um, we find teachers who are typically, um, you know, I would say about five to 10 years into teaching who are really passionate about what they do, looking for a new challenge. Um, most of our teachers tell us that the work that they do with One Schoolhouse is some of the best professional development and that it really transforms what's happening in the classroom. So if you've got some great educators that you know are looking for a new opportunity, um, we hope you'll tell them about our call for teachers and send them to our website. Great. Thank you so much. Um, other exciting news for the academic side of the house. I know I am often here with professional learning, but it is there's something about a fresh new catalog at the beginning of the year. <laughs> it just gets, it's like going to the office supply store, getting new highlighters. It's fantastic to open. So um, Liz, do you want to add any information for school leaders who are thinking about registration and checking out the catalog? So open now, registration, um, space permitting stays open all the way till September. So this is sort of like your opportunity to take a look at it and see what's going on and start to think about how the courses that we offer might fit um, and correspond um, to some of your strategic goals. Um, we're excited to have expanded both our computer science um, uh, sequence with a post AP computer science A course. And as well, um, we are working on, uh, on uh, continuing to expand our language courses so that we now um, will restructure our beginning sequence as well. So we're really in, um, and that's in French, in Spanish, in uh, Latin, and in Mandarin Chinese. Great, lots to look at there. It's exciting. So this is our Pulse question this week. Tell us words of encouragement that would mean a lot to academic leaders and educators right now. And we're going to take a look at these, but we want to just take a moment, as Liz said earlier, and really talk to you academic leaders, because you are, this is not a self-care reminder type of support, like, oh, make sure you're getting enough sleep, but do make sure you're getting enough sleep. But you're a professional. You have been doing the work for many years, some of you, to get the insights, the key understandings, and the skills that are adaptive. And you've made good decisions and communicated them well. And that is good work. And so we want to really acknowledge that you are doing something really complicated and you're following expert advice, which isn't simple because it's changing and which expert and what source. And you're acting as a researcher and a curator of information. And that's something academic leaders excel at. And we just want you to know you're doing it. You're really doing a great job. So let's look at some of the results. 
Oh, can I tell you, Sarah, that when these started coming in on Monday morning, and they started coming in within minutes of our sending the pulse out, um, it just, it's a cliche, but it warmed my heart. It just, it was so great to see colleagues talking to colleagues um, and, and sending out the messages that everybody needs to hear right now. So if you haven't had a chance to respond to the pulse, the link is in the chat, but also feel free to just put in the chat um, a reaction to one of these pieces or your own response. And we're gonna publish these on our website. We're gonna do a blog post that just encapsulates some of the sentiments coming around because we think they're that important. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I know sometimes it's hard to read on the screen, but know that we will publish this later and we'll have that in a newsletter that comes out to you. So Liz, <laughs> we picked the state and planned this webinar a while ago. We did. And, um, well, in the original plan- changed a little bit. <laughs> yeah, the original plan was that in 2020, in, uh, for to kick off 2022, we were gonna, pick our word of the year and our word of the year was going to be resilience. Um, and as I wrote in my blog post, telling people to be resilient right now just feels like a really mean thing to do because you get to be resilient once you've passed the crisis point. When you're in the crisis moment, you just need to get through. And so when we thought about what we really wanted to say to academic leaders, um, we want, we want to do two things today. The first is that we want to let you know that it is okay to be feeling any number of feelings. Um, it's okay to be overwhelmed at the moment. It's okay to feel exhausted at the moment. But we want to also tell you that those feelings aren't happening because you're not doing your job well. You are doing your job so well. Those feelings are happening because of a lot of forces outside your control. And so we want to explore a few of those and, um, and then talk about some things that we hope you can take with you into the next few weeks. So I'm going to share my screen again. We have some slides here and um, let's just see where this goes. But I invite everyone to contribute in the chat or the Q&A if you've got a question or something you want to say, hey, make sure you talk about or, or share some of your experiences along the way. So resilience comes when we get closer to the end. Liz? Well, yeah. And, you know, back in September, you know, especially for high schools, our kids were all eligible to be vaccinated. In fact, most of them were already vaccinated. We know that independent schools by and large have tremendous vaccination rates um, and that faculty have been enthusiastic about vaccination. And there was the sense that, you know, we were over the worst of it. Um, and human beings are narrative creatures. We look to find narrative. We look to find a story that has a beginning and a middle and an end. So the story we were expecting was things are moving back. We are moving back to doing school the way that we know how to do school. And that's not the narrative that we got. The narrative we got um, is, are we there yet? Right, from like, the back seat, from the front from seat. From the back seat. <laughs> Where are we going? Um, are, and, and, and how do I, how, what is this journey? And then the question of where is there? How do we know? when we've gotten to that, to where we've begun the end of a story. Mm -hmm. um, if, uh, if you, like me, are uh, an English person, um, that famous phrase, there is no there there, that's Gertrude Stein actually talking about Oakland, California, where uh, now, about 100 years after she said it, it's a great place to come and visit someday after the Omicron surge. Yeah. So Liz, you and I um, have a couple of videos that we've made in which I've interviewed you and we've talked about, hey, there's a map going on. You know, this is not necessarily completely uncharted territory. There are things that are uncharted, but there's some, some stuff that we know. So can we go back and revisit that for a little bit? We can. I know that we see some questions coming in the chat and we will definitely get to those by the end. Um, so if you've seen me before, you know that this is the piece of information that I wish we could get out um, as far as possible to as many people as possible. Um, and that's that when there is a disaster, 
humans actually have a very defined set of responses um, that right after the disaster hits, you work hard, you feel like you're on top of it. And then there's a, a fast drop down to the disillusionment period, which isn't a straight line, it's up and down. Um, but that eventually you hit reconstruction. Um, and like disillusionment, that's not a straight line either. But you know, you do have setbacks, but you keep moving upward. Yeah, so one thing that you and I were discussing as we prepared for this webinar is that um, we're living through what experts call a slow, low threat disaster, which particularly have psychological effects on children and adults that are a little bit different from a rapid, fast hit, dangerous disaster and then recovery. And you've got an analogy that um, we hope everybody will humor us for a moment with this one. So most disasters are pressure cooker disasters. They're fast, they happen, they're done. And then you look at it. Like you, there's a lot of a lot of, of of heat and a lot of activity. And then then dinner's ready, right? And you have to you have to eat the meal that you've been served. Um, where we are is what uh, what we're calling a little tongue in cheek a crock pot disaster. It's slow. It may not look like a lot is happening, but it's going and it's going and it's going. And at some point, dinner will be cooked, but it's not until a long time after you put the ingredients and turned it on. Most disasters are pressure cookered. A pandemic is a, pot, is a crock pot. So if this is the map for what one of those uh, fast and furious disasters look like, where there's a very clear impact and then there's a very clear anniversary. That's not where we are. Um, it looks more like this picture. Yeah. You, you can probably really figure like out that we literally just like expanded it and copied those valleys and mountains and like pasted them in there. That we are going through a very long period of disillusionment. Yeah, and I, sometimes I feel like we could have put a loop in here too. Um, so you get all yep. through all of those cycles of disillusionment, and then you get to start over again from the beginning. Time is a spiral. Yeah. And so the disillusionment is in multiple arenas, too. We are facing ongoing, devastating racial, economic, environmental, and political disparities. And, you know, as high profile verdicts come in for trials and we have families that are dealing with enormous loss while another family is dealing with a really different situation, tragedies are on the front page and we're getting close to a midterm election that looks like it's gonna be pretty contention, contentious. Any one of these things is, is an ongoing sustained stressor in lives. And instead we've got them all. Yeah, so can we click on to the next slide? Yep. Thanks. Um, and schools are at a unique spot here. And this is where we wanna zoom out a little bit from thinking about just your school to thinking about what schools are doing and the way that schools are functioning in the national imagination right now. Um, and that's that in many ways, schools have been tasked with maintaining an illusion of normalcy in these extraordinary times that once the schools were open, that meant that we were on the other side of this psychologically, right? It meant that for all of us who are working parents, Sarah and I will raise our hands here, um, that, you know, that suddenly the balance felt like it was maybe being restored. Um, and that this was supposed to be reassuring, even though many of our policies uh, that we've had have prioritized adult needs over children and adolescents for the past two years. So schools were tasked with maintaining this illusion of normalcy at a time when public policy was actually undercutting normalcy for our students. And so there are some real challenges that come along with this model of if schools are open, everything's okay. And we took a few minutes to talk at the beginning about academic leaders' incredible capacity to curate, assess, and communicate. But let's take a couple of minutes and talk about what academic leaders are not responsible for, even though it might seem like they are. 
so one of the things that we want people to hear is that students are not struggling because schools are doing it wrong. Teachers aren't struggling because your leadership is ineffective. And parents aren't angry because communication is insufficient. Or you could put in any number of things after that last because, quite frankly. Um, we are all struggling because we are in the middle of a global crisis that we have been living with for 20 months. It is hard because it is hard. And there's this expectation that if academic leaders were doing everything right, they'd have students' well-being in the palm of their hands and easy to control. And as we've seen, all of us communicators and the recipients of communication, um, I got four messages yesterday that sent me into like, am I supposed to do this or am I supposed to do this? But every one of those messages needed to be sent. And so it was my job as a parent to sort through this particular set of information and it was hard to do. And I know that the school leaders where my children go to school are doing the absolute best that they can and they are responding moment by moment to that information. And Karina asks a really good question here in the chat. Are schools concerned about teacher and administrator attrition? And I would love to put that back to the group and ask, are you worried about that? If you wanted to put in the chat, um, I think it is absolutely a concern. I've not heard anybody say, oh, that's not a worry for us. Liz, how about you? No, and I can tell you that here at One School, as we've had unprecedented numbers of schools reaching out to us um, about teacher departures, um, that it's usually one or two schools for the whole winter season. We're averaging two to three schools every few days. It's really different. Um, you know, we are not immune from the uh, sort of the great resignation or the big quit, whatever you want to call it. Right. And we have a workforce that is um, often parents of young children. And we know uh, 60 Minutes just did a special on the great resignation. And there are millions of women who have left the workforce and are still missing. And they might be parents of students. They might be teachers in your school. They might be administrators. And so that is, um, that is a hole in our landscape right now. And it's a stressor. Let's talk about a couple of other things. So because oh, some yeses, let's make sure if you do <laughs> yes. we'll reply to everyone. So I'm getting a sort of a little flood of these. Thank you for when you yeah. share with everyone so they can see it too. This is great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and so because schools have been have had to assume this outside burden of reassuring everybody that everything's okay, it means that schools are also being blamed. And they're being held for res responsible for challenges that are outside their scope. It is not your job to create a normal world or a normal bubble in a world that is anything but normal, let alone a new normal. You know, we're not there right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so that piece that, that schools are essentially um, the place where all of this is getting focused is what's making your job that ordinarily is hard. Even in good years, it's challenging being an academic leader. They're the challenges we wanna do, but it's challenging. Um, it's just piling challenge upon challenge. So Liz, you have some, um, some ideas about some things that can help, some strategies. So let's, let's take a look. So this is kind of our- the first thing is just to say that the work that you do is the flashpoint for children's mental health. And that's because you are the expert and you know aggregates and you know children in the aggregate. At the same time, there is no way that any one school or any one leader can solve all of the things that are challenging our students right now. That's not your job. Your job is to make the space you have as safe and healthy as possible for the students that you have in the world that they are currently living in. So, 
so we want to give you four kind of mottos, but four things to really take with you when you leave this. Um, these are things that like I have written in front of stickies and are literally like right on the wall behind my laptop. Um, because we think they're really important for you to remember and you to hold on to. And we hope that also that you'll pass them on to people. Sarah, do you want to talk about this one? I do. But, and I said it at the beginning and I'm going to say it again. And this is also something that you really want to coach other people with when they come to you in perhaps um, some despair. You are competent. The fact that everybody is not okay, is that is not happening because you are incompetent. You have great communication skills. You have insights. You have adaptive expertise. The situation is challenging, but you are competent. And if you needed to hear that again, I'll say it again. You are competent. You are good at your work. The second thing is that you can fix only what's in your control. And this connects back to where we talk about schools being tasked with the burden of reassuring this, our society as a whole. You can't reassure society. You can take care of the students and the educators who are within your community and you are doing that. So those other pieces about trying to make sure that kids can go to their club basketball practice, that is not in your control. What is in your control is keeping your community as safe, as healthy, and as focused on growth as is possible. Great advice. So you can pull back the curtain. It is also okay to remind folks that the flashpoint, the school, the that this is happening in the middle of all of these other things. And yes, school is open or we're teaching remotely or we're doing a combination of those things, but it's not a marker. It is not a marker for a healthy functioning society all by itself that schools are open. It's important, it's a part of our landscape, but it doesn't fix all those other things. Liz, do you wanna elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, that the challenges that we are experiencing are not about, the schools are a small piece of it. They are part of how the United States handles childcare and how the United States handles healthcare and how the United States has, uh, handles inequity and how the United States, whether that's uh, racial, social, income, we live in a time of widening inequity, widening tensions. And all of those things are part of what's making this moment so hard. And so it's tempting to say that you're, you know, no school is in isolation. And so it's okay to remind people that these things are not simply within our personal spheres of control. And to remind people of that, your life is not complicated because you're not doing it well. Your life is complicated because you are a part of systems and processes that go far, far beyond the individual. It's a great reminder. And then this is the backpack analogy. And just this idea that we are all carrying, you know, there's a nice school image there, right? Everybody's marching into school with their backpacks on. So when we say, I will take care of what's mine, what we mean is that it's really healthy to, to draw some boundaries between what is within your sphere of responsibility and what isn't. Um, we sort of uh, think about this as like, let's say you're going off camping with a group of friends. You're all carrying your own stuff. And then each of, care of you is carrying some piece of what's communal. Somebody's carrying the cooking supplies that everybody will use. And you should carry some of that. But it's not that the five other people in your party are just carrying their clothes and you're carrying the tent and the cooking supplies and the tools that you'll need and some firewood. You take care of your own responsibilities and take care of, of what you can of your community. It is not your job to take care of everything. And I think academic leaders are carers by nature. And there is certainly the moment where somebody stumbles and everybody says, oh, we're going to, we'll grab your backpack and we'll carry it for a little while while you get your, yourself back together. 
but we don't say, everybody, give me your backpack. I got them all. Right. So there's, there's balance there. And that can be really hard for people who are in compassionate, caring careers. So the last thing that we want to say is that we hope that the past 25 minutes or so have been reassuring to you. And just to remember that as a leader, everyone needs some reassurance right now. And that being, uh, that, that being a person who, who can share that with other people and help other people feels good. I know that when I was watching those words come in, in our pulse response, that they helped raise me too. Um, and so to remember that, that we are a community of caring. And I'm going to stop sharing just for a minute so that we're both full screen again. And I want everyone who's here to think about someone in your community who might need to hear that they are competent, that they are carrying what's appropriate for them to carry, and that you're proud of them. So I bet I bet everybody here can think of someone who needs to hear that. And there's a couple more things coming in just to the hosts and palists, and I would encourage everybody to, to share with all. Um, I think ah, it's Peter who says that schools have become a proxy for everything that people want to believe. And, and schools are supposed to reflect all that. And that's because they, they hold our children, which are our promise and our future. And you know, that's where we are right now. And, and Peter also says, and I love these two words together. He says, act and hope. Um, and you're doing all of those things right now. We just want you to know you're not alone. You're part of a community of people who are working together. We are here for you. We're here for you at one schoolhouse. We know that every person on this call is there for every other person, even though you can't see each other right now. Um, and just if, if we can be a little place where for a few minutes, you know, and you believe in your competence and your strength, um, that that we hope that we made today just a little bit a little bit easier. We know these are hard days. You're doing tremendous work. We appreciate you. We admire you. We're grateful for you, and we know you can do it. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>